1 Samuel chapter 28. This is the word of the Lord. And it came to pass in those days that the Philistines gathered their armies together for warfare to fight with Israel. And Achish said unto David, Know thou assuredly that thou shalt go out with me to battle, thou and thy men. And David said to Achish, Surely thou shalt know what thy servant can do. And Achish said to David, Therefore will I make thee keeper of mine head forever. Now Samuel was dead, and all Israel had lamented him, and buried him in Ramah, even in his own city. And Saul had put away those that had familiar spirits, and the wizards out of the land. And the Philistines gathered themselves together, and came and pitched in Shunem. And Saul gathered all Israel together, and they pitched in Gilboa. And when Saul saw the host of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart greatly trembled. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. Then said Saul unto his servant, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment. And he went, and two men with him, and they came to the woman by night. And he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit, and bring me him up, whom I shall name unto thee. And the woman said unto him, Behold, thou knowest what Saul hath done, how he hath cut off those that have familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. Wherefore then, layest thou a snare for my life to cause me to die? And Saul sware to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord liveth, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this thing. Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, Bring me up Samuel. And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice, and the woman spake to Saul, saying, Why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. And the king said unto her, Be not afraid, for what sawest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. And he said unto her, What form is he of? And she said, An old man cometh up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel. And he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. And Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, I am sore distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God is departed from me. And answereth me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called thee that thou mayest know, make known unto me what I shall do. And said to Samuel, Wherefore then dost thou ask of me, seeing the Lord is departed from thee, and is become thine enemy? And the Lord hath done to him as he spake by me, for the Lord hath rent the kingdom of thine hand, and given it to thy neighbor, even to David. Because thou obeyest not the voice of the Lord, nor executest his fierce wrath upon Amalek, Therefore hath the Lord done this thing unto thee this day. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel in, with thee into the hand of the Philistines. And tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be with me. The Lord also shall deliver the host of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. Then Saul fell straightway all along on the earth and was sore afraid because of the words of Samuel. And there was no strength in him, for he had eaten no bread all the day nor all the night. And the woman came unto Saul, and saw that he was sore troubled, and said unto him, Behold, thine handmaid hath obeyed thy voice, and I have put my life in my hand, and have hearkened unto thy words which thou spakest unto me. Now therefore I pray thee, hearken thou also unto the voice of thine handmaid, and let me set a morsel of bread before thee, and eat, that thou mayest have strength when thou goest on thy way. But he refused, and said, I will not eat. But his servants, together with the woman, compelled him, and he hearkened unto their voice. So he arose from the earth and sat upon the bed. And the woman had a fat calf in the house, and she hasted and killed it, and took flour and kneaded it, and did bake unleavened bread thereof. And she brought it before Saul and before his servants, and they did eat. Then they rose up and went away that night. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for this time to come together. We thank you for... Uh, the precious gift of your word. We pray that you would uh, help us to glean what you have for us in it tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So Israel had not been who they were supposed to be. And that is because a long while ago at this point, Saul had forsaken God and his commandments. Israel had been who they were supposed to be because of what Saul had done as their king. These two things go hand in hand, to forsake God and to forsake his commandments. And Saul had surely done this. And because Saul had done this, because he had forsaken God, he had not walked in obedience. It's impossible to do one and not the other. Saul's duty was to lead Israel under the blessing and guidance of Almighty God to conquer all of her foes, all of Israel's foes, to inherit the promised land and to worship Jehovah through all of it. This, as we have seen, is not the way that things went down throughout Saul's reign. When you think about what Israel was called to, you should think of things like trusting God, courage in battle, bravery in conquest. The promises of God are meant to be walked in with humble confidence and provide the people of God with an assurance of God's care and a love that casts out ungodly fears. Contrary to this picture is that of Saul. And we've seen that laid out throughout 1 Samuel. Cast off God's word, and you have cast off God. We can only know God in accordance with his revelation to us, his word. Cast off God's word, and you will be left with all kinds of ungodly fears. At this point in the story, Saul is rather consumed by fear, and it's a theme in our text tonight. And we see that manifested throughout this account. It has, and only continues here, to dominate his emotions and his actions. His emotions, his actions are dominated by fear, consuming and eventually destroying him. Without the fear of God in his heart, Saul winds up in one of the darkest places in all of Israel. He's with the witch in the night in Endor, desperately seeking guidance to face an enemy that he should have wiped out a long time ago. Saul acts desperately, steadily declining from his righteous rule all the way to the end. Right? That's the unfortunate story that we see Saul walking in. And David, in many ways like a son to him, comes in this battle, or this battle with the Philistines that's right, right in front of him, David comes marching with the Philistines. That's a fruit of Saul's disobedience. Let's look at verses 1 and 2. And it came to pass in those days that the Philistines gathered their armies together for warfare to fight with Israel. And Achish said unto David, Know thou assuredly that thou shalt go out with me to battle, thou and thy men. And David said to Achish, Surely thou shalt know what thy servant can do. And Achish said to David, Therefore will I make thee keeper of mine head forever. So we pick up again with the Philistines preparing to fight against Israel. And this conflict, we shouldn't think of this conflict as coming out of the blue. Like things between Israel and the Philistines have been good up until this point, and all of a sudden the Philistines are coming in battle. Right? We've seen throughout 1 Samuel so far that the Philistines have been warring against Israel, and always the ones coming on the offensive against Israel. Any fight, Israel's on the defensive. They came against the Kenites. They attacked some Israelite city while Saul was pursuing David in the wilderness. And they were the nation, remember all the way back in the beginning, that took the Ark of the Covenant. All of that has been the Philistines. We aren't told what motivated this particular fight, but my guess is that it has something to do with the fact that Achish now has David. He has David on his side, and he's heard of David, right? David's come to him, bringing him gifts upon the conquest of these lands, and David's insinuated that he's been actually attacking Judah, Israel, their allies. And so, of course, Achish wants David and his men to go with him into battle. David had given him the impression that he was already warring against Israel, so the word from Achish should be no surprise for David, that he would want David at his right hand. David's only response to Achish is that Achish should already know what he is capable of, affirming Achish's command. Achish tells David that he will be at the king's side, his personal bodyguard, in the battle against Israel. Achish wants this to be David's permanent role, his bodyguard forever. Achish knows the commodity that he has in David. It's a great commodity, he's a great warrior. He just doesn't know what he actually, that what he doesn't have is David's loyalty. He thinks he has David's loyalty, but he doesn't have that. So he thinks he has a mighty warrior. He thinks he has his loyalty because he thinks he's got a man enslaved to bitterness against Israel. That's not what he has. And there's a picture here of our relationship to sin. When you think about Saul and his relationship to the Philistines. Right, what he should have done and what's coming upon him because he failed to do what he should have done. Saul should have wiped him out long ago. And now they come against him with great strength, even with Saul's best man. Leave your sin alone now, and it will not disappear. None of it, even the little things, none of it will disappear. 
You will not magically deal with anger more righteously. Your kids will not magically know and love God's law. Your marriage will not magically be filled with fruitful lovemaking. You will not magically start praying like you should. Not only will you not magically grow positively, but you will deteriorate. Sin will grow, it will metastasize. If you have lusts and vices in your heart, if you have lusts and vices in your heart, they won't remain manageable. They will grow, and they will crush you. Adultery doesn't typically come with no precursors, right? There's pornography use, there's lustful eyes that are not disciplined, lustful thoughts that are fixated on, and on and on the progression goes. The Philistines weren't magically going to go away for Saul. His problems have only grown worse. He ignored this issue, something that God commanded him to do, and it's only grown worse. The analogy plays out perfectly because this war would kill Saul. This neglect of the Philistines would wind up killing him. John Owen said it the best, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. Didn't plan that. The solution is repentance. Acknowledge your sin before God, cast it on Christ, and turn from it. Ignore it and die. Now Samuel was dead, verse 3. And all Israel had lamented him and buried him in Ramah, even in his own city. And Saul had put away those that had familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. Well, Samuel had been dead for a little while now. But is recounted for us here because he makes a reappearance in our story. Or at least some believe he makes a reappearance in our story. And also to remind us that he really died. I think that's why that's in our text. That he really died. He was buried in Rama, right? Like David was talking about with Pontius Pilate. Fixes it in a place in history, right? He was buried in a place. There were people there who mourned the death. It happened. He was buried in Rama. He was mourned by Israel. It was done. And there would be no way to get Samuel back. Because anyone who would claim to do that kind of work had been cast out of the land by Saul. They're all gone. And we know that whenever a command is made for wickedness to be cast out of the land, all the wickedness is automatically gone. That's how laws work. Right, Saul took care to get those familiar or demonic spirits, the witches and the wizards, out of the land. Right, in truth, righteous law helps. Righteous law helps a society. Hopefully we'll soon see abortion outlawed in Nampa. But ultimately, evil will remain as long as hearts are not turned to the Lord. Right, you can make all the laws you want. Evil will remain in the land as long as, far, as long as hearts are not turned to the Lord. It is objectively good to make good laws that criminalize what God says is criminal. Driving such evildoers from publicly and proudly sinning into the darkness. That's a good thing. But hearts need to turn to God for a land to be truly filled with righteousness. And there could be one of two reasons, depending on, you know, different commentators have different takes on when, really when Saul cast out the familiar spirits from the land and based on when he did it, uh, kind of surmising why he did it. So it could have been some of the good fruit from his early days in office. Could have been one of those things he saw, and you know, like the good kings you read about that toppled idols. It could have been one of those things that Saul saw this in the land. He knew very explicitly in the Old Testament that these things were not to be so in the land of Israel. There was to be none of this divination, no witches, no wizards. And so he cast them out. Maybe he made a point of casting divination out of the land simply to honor God and be a faithful king. Right? That's a possibility. I don't think we're given a clear timeline as to when he, he does this. But some commentators make another argument that this was an action Saul took after the spirit had departed from him. The argument is that Saul felt like he, would, he himself was demon-possessed. And so his solution was to try and rid himself of the demon by casting out all those who dabbled in such work in the land. Which honestly, from the way he handles this interaction when he doesn't hear from the Lord, I think is a plausible option. He's quick to turn to whatever he thinks is going to give him the solution he needs. Maybe if he, could not, maybe if he could get them all out of the land, this would resolve his problem. Now the proponents of the first position would say that Saul's willingness later in his life to consult such mediums was just the fruit of the spirit having departed from him, which is very plausible. 
the proponents of the latter position see Saul's witch inquiry as the proof that his edict was never an edict from the heart. It was never something he actually cared about, honoring God, honoring his law. Either way, the principle holds that men can stand publicly against a sin in their life, in their ministry, in their ruling, and yet treasure that same sin in their own heart. Your words mean nothing if your heart is far from God. Verses 4 and 5. And the Philistines gathered themselves together and came and pitched in Shinem. And Saul gathered all Israel together and they pitched in Gilboa. And when Saul saw the host of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart greatly trembled. And if you remember back to the last time Saul got wind of a Philistine attack and saw them approaching, you'll remember that his response is much the same. Right? Saul's been marked by fear for a long time. His heart didn't tremble at the thought of disobeying God, the one who would hold him eternally accountable for how he led Israel. His heart trembled before the Philistines. Earthly circumstances. And that will also mark our passage. The Philistines set up camp near the Valley of Jezreel, strategically located between what would later become the dividing line between the northern and southern kingdoms of Israel and Judah, respectively. The Philistines sought to divide Israel, and Saul was setting them up to do just that. Verse 6, And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. So Saul's, Saul's first move, right, he's, he's scared, and he's, he goes to consult the Lord. This thought in isolation would be good. Right, that is where we should turn. Our first thought in distress should be to go to the Lord. But God is not one of multiple options in terms of where we can turn. Unfortunately, we will see that this is how Saul thought of God by his subsequent actions. Right? God's not the first place you turn, and then you can turn to, you know, if God, if God forsakes you, then you can turn to even things that God hates, and all's well and good. If Saul does not hear from the Lord in his dreams. Right? A medium God had used with, this is a medium God had used with other faithful kings, rulers, kings of other nations. For Saul had turned from the law of the Lord. Why would he hear from the, from the Lord in a dream? He turned from the law of the Lord. And so his prayers were not heard by God. And if your prayers are not heard by God, they're not answered by him. Saul did not hear from the Lord in the Urim, or by the Urim. Because Saul himself had slain the priests at Nob. You want to hear from the, you want to hear from the Urim? You just slayed the priests. What business do you have consulting them? And remember where the ephod is now. Where's the priestly garment? It's in David's camp. Right? The one priest who made it out went to David's camp. And he had the priestly garments. Saul was not going to hear by the Aaron. And Saul did not hear from the Lord by the prophets. Right? There's a time when Samuel, when 1 Samuel said that Saul was among the prophets. Saul was said to be among the prophets. There was a time when Saul had Samuel the prophet as an ally. And even David. But Saul turned from Samuel's counsel. He sought to offer his own sacrifices and make his own decrees apart from the will of the Lord. Saul had been persecuting the Lord's anointing. And so he would not be hearing from God through God's messengers. It's folly to think that we have God's ear in a time of distress if we refuse to worship him. Right? That's, that's who Saul is. Refusing to worship God and, that, and yet in a moment of distress he's going to come as if he has his ear. As if he doesn't need, if he, I mean, if he came with a plea for mercy, I think we'd be having a different, we'd be seeing something different. That's not how it comes. So many people live their lives in sin and presume upon another day. A later opportunity to turn to God, a later opportunity to make things right with him. But preachers of the gospel have long said that today's the day of salvation. Because another day is not promised. Saul was not turning to the Lord in repentance for his failures and asking for God's mercy. He just wanted help. And he asks selfishly, quickly ready to turn to the next alternative if God would not answer. Just like we saw on Sunday in Psalm 6, our greatest problem is our sin. Any earthly trouble should just remind us of our more fundamental problem of sin before God. Repentance must come first. Repentance must come first. And Saul here cared not for it. He cared not for repentance. Because of this, Saul gives his servants an immediate charge. And I think this shows his heart in coming to the Lord in the first place. Verse 7. Then said Saul unto his servants, 
Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, surely they didn't know this off the cuff. They probably had to go figure this out. Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. And Saul's got the kind of men in his group who apparently know exactly where to find a woman who claimed to communicate with the dead. And right in the land of Manasseh, in Endor, in Israel, Saul's edict was still in place. The ban on witches had not been lifted, and yet witches were in the land. But Saul's going to seek him out to ask for some help. Saul does not want to know her whereabouts to kill her or to banish her from the land, but to inquire of her. Round one with God didn't work out. And so instead of pleading with the Lord for mercy, instead of waiting there, that's the only place to wait, right? If he actually cared, if he actually knew the dynamic, he either has God's mercy or he has nothing. There's just nowhere else to go. You just wait there. You just plead with the Lord for mercy. It's just not his heart. Round one with God didn't work out, and so instead of pleading with the Lord for mercy, he turns to a woman who makes her company with demons. And verse 8 tells us how he came, and Saul disguised himself, and put on other raiment, and he went, and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night, and he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit, and bring me him up, whom I shall name unto thee. So here again we see Saul's true heart, toward those who had familiar spirits. And therefore, his heart toward God and toward God's law. Because God's law was not silent on this. That's why Saul made the edict in the first place. Saul didn't come up with that. It's very clear in the scriptures. There's to be none of this in the land. Saul was eager now to get a word of comfort and willing to consult with demons to get that comfort. But even in Saul's desperation, he knew there was a right way to go about such evil foolish way to go about it and a wise way to go about it. He should disguise himself. He should take off his kingly garments, which he's been symbolically taking off for a while now, and put on less distinguished apparel. He doesn't need a large following that would draw attention. Just a couple guys, just a little bit of protection. And he certainly should not go to this witch in the daytime. I don't even know if witches are awake during the daytime. Just thought of that. Probably not. Nighttime is much more suitable for such endeavors. Sinners love darkness. They love the cover of night and every disguise that shades them from the earthly consequences of their actions. Right? Because that's all he's that's all he's heading off with any of these things. It's just earthly consequences. It's not like any of those things change God's view of the whole thing. And this sheds light on the evil of our day. You know, our land has turned so far from righteousness. That the cover of night has been thrown off of many heinous sins. Many heinous sins are done in broad daylight and proudly. Kids are taught publicly about the goodness of mutilating their own bodies if they feel like that is what is good for them. If they feel like that's what's good for them. A kid. People are encouraged to shout their abortions. How is it so public? They're killing kids. People participate in homosex and have parades about it. People have been stoned from, by, from that in light of God's law. States who shouldn't be in the marriage business in the first place give them the right to homosex marriage. That's celebrated. Right? And that's commonplace at this point. And we stand against it, and that's commonplace for us, so oh, of course we stand against that. That's a heinous sin. That's something that was done in the darkness for a long time. And for good reason. It's a heinous sin. It's a crime. That sin used to be criminal. It used to operate in the darkness, under disguises. Now it's celebrated, considered, considered a fundamental human right, a marker of freedom. But freedom, right, that, uh, that line of propaganda, freedom in and of itself is not a good thing. Freedom in and of itself is not a good thing. Right? If someone brings that to you, well, don't you care about people's freedom? Well, freedom, just broad freedom for whatever, it's not a good thing. Freedom to sin is just plain evil. Part of the good news of the gospel is that we are both free from the curse of the law 
which we have broken, and also free to obey God. Freed from the curse of the law and freed to obey God. That's good freedom. We celebrate freedom from the curse of sin, which we have in Christ. We have that freedom in Christ and freedom to obey the law of God by his spirit. Not freedom in the abstract. Not freedom to do whatever you see fit. Grounded by the word of God. Everything grounded by the word of God. Freedom, love, peace, hope. What are any of those things if not rooted in the Word of God? We were at the city council meeting this week, and these kids were talking about hope for the, at the Boys and Girls Club. And one of the council women asked the kids if they had hope. They said yes. She asked them what hope was, and they said, I don't know. And everyone laughed like it was cute and just started cheering. The reality is those kids have no idea what hope is. It's just a, a, some butterflies in their stomach, somebody smiling at them. That's hope for them. That's not what hope is. Everything rooted in the word of God or folly. Saul wants this witch to use her abilities to call up a spirit from the dead. Not only does he bring wrath upon this evil woman, but he comes, or not, not only does he not bring wrath upon this evil woman, right? That's what he should have done, right? If he was being a good king, uh, honestly, he's got a battle with the Philistines to take care of, so he's already off track. But if that wasn't happening, and he runs into this woman, take care of this woman. Banish her from the land, execute her, whatever he's been doing, whatever the law of God says, take care of it. But he's not bringing wrath upon the evil woman, he's coming requesting her services. I mean, this would be like a magistrate outlawing prostitution and is showing up at the nearest underground brothel. The magistrate knows uh, such evil shouldn't be in the land. And not only that, but wants to be seen as one who hates such evil. One who hates such vile works. That doesn't mean he doesn't want to partake himself. Verse 9. And the woman said unto him, Behold, thou knowest what Saul hath done, how he hath cut off those that have familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. Wherefore then layest thou a snare for my life to cause me to die? I think there's a connection we should see here between Saul and this witch of Endor. Both had a concern for being caught in the middle of this wicked act. Right? Think about the way that Saul came to her. Think about her first words to Saul after he is trying to procure her services. Both of them didn't want to be caught in the middle of this wicked act. But both had thoroughly cast off God. Their concerns are not for God's law. Right? They both have concerns about consequences, but neither of them care about God's law. Nor are they fearful that everything they're doing is done before God's face. Right? That's plain. Everything that they're doing, everything that everyone does, is done before the face of God. Nothing is hid from Him. They're not concerned with that. Though other night travelers would not recognize Saul, God saw his disguise. God saw through that. Though this witch was able to continue in her wicked ways, God would one day lay all of it bare, all of her witchcraft bare, and would hold her accountable. Now, they're concerned purely with earthly consequences. Wicked men often care much more for earthly consequences than displeasing their creator. Saul did not want to be found out by men who could call him a hypocrite. Didn't you make this edict, this decree? This woman did not want to practice an act that she knew had been condemned by the king in the land. She didn't want to get in trouble. What she did not know at this point is that the king, who made the decree, stood before her making this request. This witch is not actually concerned about performing her role as a medium with demons. Right? She's, her conscience isn't bound against doing that. She had certainly been practicing her trade after Saul had placed the ban on such acts. Right? His men knew right where to go. This is a test of Saul's dedication, likely. This is just a test of Saul's dedication to actually wanting her help. She may have just been asking for further payment for the services or simply locking in her customer with greater commitment. There's no snare from Saul, just a request from the last person of the witch expected. Verse 10. And Saul sware to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord liveth, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this thing. Really? So how does Saul respond to this test by the witch? He swears in the name of the Lord that she will not get in trouble. Which is not really his call to make. 
maybe in the here and now, but ultimately not his call to make. Saul swears in the name of the Lord that he will not obey the word of the Lord nor enforce the law of the Lord. He will not obey the word of the Lord. He will not enforce the law of the Lord. The, and not even a law that he needs to put in place, but a law he's already put in place he needs to walk in light of. Saul promises his witch immunity. Could Saul say a more wicked thing to this witch? What business does a man have swearing in God's name to literally disobey God? This is blasphemous on Saul's part. It is to take the Lord's name in vain, to call down a curse on himself. Don't ever speak for God where you do not know his will. And certainly do not speak for him in knowing opposition to his will. What folly, what sin. To invoke God's name is a fearful thing and not to be done lightly. Saul knew the law of God requiring, uh, regarding which is what it required of him. It was not ambiguous or unknown to him. Obviously, he set a very clear decree in place. And yet, for the purpose of fulfilling his own lusts, and that's the only reason he's here, indulging his own fears, he assures this witch that nothing will befall her. Saul might be able to protect her in the immediate, but not for long. And said the woman, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, Bring me up Samuel. Once all the front-end issues are solved, business taken care of, probably money exchanged. Saul comforts this witch by promising her that he will see to it, invoking God's name, that God's law has no standing in the matter. And she offers her services. The witch offers to bring something, or someone rather, up from the dead. And so a fair question at this point is whether or not that is something this witch has the ability to do. This woman was a medium, which means that she was believed to consult the dead. This is often mentioned in scripture in conjunction with necromancers, those who spoke on behalf of the dead. Isaiah, in the book of Isaiah, said that these types of individuals, quote, chirp and mutter, end quote. And he mocked the folly of trying to interact with the dead on behalf of the living through such means, instead of seeking the living God. That's in Isaiah chapter 8. And so I take this, woman, this woman's familiar spirit to be a demon, and a demon that simply impersonated the dead. This woman had a dark connection with the spiritual world, and although there was dark magic in that dynamic, it was not an all-powerful magic. I do not believe this woman possessed the power to summon Samuel from the dead. And so it looks like Saul's inquiry here would not be worth it. I think what she would claim to do is to speak on behalf of Samuel. Basically to be a medium between Samuel and Saul. He's asking a little too much of this witch from Endor. Her dark magic only goes so far. God has made a magical world... The kind of world where seas are parted and where God does have the power to bring resurrection life. But I do not believe demons have power to bring up souls from Sheol. I think this witch was planning to facilitate a demonic conversation with Saul. And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice and the woman spake to Saul saying, Why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. So things heat up quickly. Samuel comes up potentially before he's even summoned, which indicates how much this witch had to do with what was happening. She cried in a loud voice as if startled. So I think it either happened apart from her summons completely or her dark magic accomplished more than it normally did. It appears that she is surprised with the result. And if she was normally just facilitating conversations through a demon, maybe it was the physical manifestation that startled her so greatly because she beholds Samuel. The witch now knows that she's speaking to Saul. It's another interesting fact. She just seems to kind of come upon that knowledge. So it's potentially some information from her demon friend that he shared with her. She immediately knows it's Saul when she sees Samuel. She is terrified by Samuel's appearance and probably confused by Saul. Wasn't Saul the one who was against this kind of witchcraft? Well, not when he needed it. Sin is condemned by Saul until it might benefit him. And we often do the same thing. We condemn the sin in others most greatly that we ourselves partake in. 
if we're honest. Prideful people really hate people with pride. You can see it so clearly. A slanderer can smell another slanderer from a mile away and notices even subtle moves, small plays. No more from him. This interaction, and the king said unto her, Be not afraid, for what sawest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. So apparently Saul is not in the room with her, or there's some kind of separation between them. She's seeing something that he's not seeing. And he said unto her, What form is he of? And she said, An old man cometh up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he stood with his face to the ground and bowed himself. And Saul tries to comfort the witch. It's kind of a, a funny dynamic. This man marked by fear, probably just fearful that she's going to screw up this interaction he's about to have. He's like, calm down, it's okay. And this man marked by fear tells her to not be fearful, and likely only because he's fixated on making sure he heard from Samuel. Right? That's why he's here. The witch says she saw a judge, gods, ascending out of the earth, an old man covered with a mantle, maybe the same one that Saul had ripped. Saul is not seeing him, possibly due to being in a different room, as I mentioned. But when he perceives it as Samuel, he, we read, he bows himself to the ground. Saul probably wanted to show genuine respect to Samuel. Probably really wanted to. But he had forsaken any true reverence for Samuel when he sought to bring him up in the first place. This bowing was an example of Saul's folly. How did he expect any kind of fav favor with this behavior? Coming to a medium... Hey, just forget about how we got here. It's good to see you. Like, what, do you. What does he expect from this interaction? He was desperate and bold enough to forsake the word of the Lord. If we make the decision to try and cover up our sin, we will ruin... Run, rather. That makes more sense. We'll run anywhere we can, chasing solutions. Try to cover up your sin. You're going to run anywhere you can searching for solutions. One clear solution. Bring it to God. Repentance. But if we don't do that, if we don't turn there, then we're going to be running anywhere we can to try to cover up our sin. Taking any solution that offers itself to us. Anything that pops into, into our head. But ultimately, we cannot secure true blessing apart from God. It's just impossible. Again, everything rooted in the word of God Blessing rooted in the word of God. We're not going to receive blessing, achieve blessing apart from the word of God. We cannot secure it as we walk contrary to his law. Saul took a posture of humility before Samuel, but he called for Samuel in pride. Right? He bows himself down. But he's there in his pride. And Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, I am sore distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God is departed from me and answereth me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called thee, that thou mayest make known unto me what I shall do. And then said Samuel, Wherefore then dost thou ask of me, seeing the Lord is departed from thee? What does Samuel have to say that the Lord would not have said? Samuel speaks on behalf of the Lord. Wherefore then dost thou ask of me, seeing the Lord is departed from thee and is become thine enemy. And the Lord hath done to him as he spake by me. For the Lord hath rent the kingdom out of thine hand and given it to thy neighbor, even to David. Because thou obeyest not the voice of the Lord, nor executed his fierce wrath upon Amalek. Therefore hath the Lord done this thing to thee this day. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel into, with thee into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be with me. The Lord also shall deliver the host of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. Now there are some great Reformed commentators who believe that Samuel does not actually appear in this narrative at all. They take this appearance of Samuel to be a demonic imposter. who speaks to Saul as if he's Samuel. Much of this understanding has to do with the witch's inability to call forth those who have already died. Or they rest upon that, that truth. They present that as a reality and, and then force say this is an impossibility. 
And one problem I have with this view is that Samuel is called Samuel in the text. which seems pretty straightforward to me. And not just by Saul, but as a character in the text. And why would the Bible refer to the speaker as Samuel if it was a demon? Another problem is that the speaker does not really speak like a demon. There's, I, I'd be hard-pressed to find anything in his statement that would make me think it's not Samuel speaking. In the same tenor that he's been speaking to Saul since Saul started to disobey the word of the Lord all the way back. Right, he speaks like Samuel. Samuel, he starts by questioning, questioning Saul for seeking him after he had gone to Sheol. Samuel focuses on truth about Saul and his relationship to God, telling Saul that it is useless to seek God's servant. Why would you seek God's servant for a word when the God of heaven has departed and become your enemy? What do you think is going to change here? You think I have a word for you? You went to the living prophets, they had nothing for you. You had nothing from the Urim. You have nothing in your dreams, nothing in your prayers. And so you go, you take a sinful route to summon up Samuel, and now you think you're going to get an answer? Samuel uses the term rent when he speaks of the kingdom being taken from Saul, surely as a reference to Saul renting Samuel's own garment, and does so to say explicitly that his kingdom was being taken and given over explicitly, he says, to David. And the reason for the kingdom being taken from Saul, and this is again from the mouth of Samuel, all in line with the word of the Lord, doesn't sound like a demon to me. The reason the kingdom was being taken from Saul was similar to his reason for speaking with Samuel at this moment. Saul had disobeyed the word of the Lord. He's only in this moment now with Samuel because he's disobeyed the word of the Lord. He's having the kingdom taken from him because he's disobeyed the word of the Lord. The Lord was taking Saul's kingdom because Saul refused to fight for the Lord and be the extension of God's wrath against the Amalekites. That's what he was called to, and he refused to do it. Not only would Saul lose the kingdom, but Samuel, and I believe it is clearly Samuel speaking, says that Saul and his sons will die at the hands of the Philistines. Saul's complacency as king, his comfort with what he already had, and his distrust in the Lord led to his enemies being built up instead of crushed. Instead of his enemies being crushed, with God fighting with him, his enemies have been built up, and now they're going to come for him. Israel will be handed over to the Philistines because Saul refused to fight. Verses 20 through 25. Then Saul fell straightway all along the, on the earth and was sore afraid. His fear has only grown throughout the text. Because of the words of Samuel, and there was no strength in him, for he had eaten no bread all the day nor all the night. And the woman came unto Saul, and saw that he was sore troubled, and said unto him, Behold, thine handmaid hath obeyed thy voice. Mercy of the wicked is cruel. And I have put my life in my hands, and have hearkened unto thy words which thou spakest unto me. Now therefore I pray thee, hearken thou also unto the voice of thine handmaid, and let me set a morsel of bread before thee, and eat that thou mayest have strength when thou goest on thy way. But he refused and said, I will not eat. But his servants together with the woman compelled him, and he hearkened unto their voice. So he arose from the earth and sat upon the bed. And the woman had a fat calf in the house, and she hasted and killed it, and took flour and kneaded it, and did bake unleavened bread thereof. And she brought it before Saul and before his servants, and they did eat. Then they rose up and went away that night. Saul's at first too frightened to eat, too upset. But Saul would partake of what symbolically is this twisted Passover meal with his servants and the witch. Saul refuses to heed the word of the Lord, but he is able to be convinced rather easily to heed the words of this witch. To dine at this table of demons. That rebuke from Samuel wasn't enough to Cause him to walk away from that place. Go to God in repentance for his sins. No. Saul's end was on the horizon. And he shared his, one of his last recorded meals with a demon witch in the night. Stripped of his royal robes and on the heels of yet another rebuke from God's messenger. 
Saul was not going to find a way around the judgment of the Lord. And that's what he's seeking to do. One way or another, he wants a way apart from repentance to avoid the judgment of the Lord, and it would not come to him. And this is the fruit of sinful compromise. Right? That's marked his whole ministry as king. Saul has made his own lines, and they were not in line with God's. For us, there can be no quarter given to sin in our hearts, no level of compromise in our families. We cannot allow for any level of it. There is no weighing of the pros and cons that needs to take place in regards to partaking in evil in your workplace. There is no time that we should give to indulging selfishness, lustful thoughts, or desires. You are to give them no time, no consideration. Serve yourself and wind up at a table of demons on the eve of your death. It is not a pretty end for compromisers. Or follow Jesus. Or follow Jesus and know that there is no man that hath left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and for the gospels. But he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions, and in the world to come, eternal life. Let's pray. Father, I pray that we would fear nothing more than you. I pray that you'd help us to know and to heed your word. So much we know already that we choose to not heed day in and day out. We pray that you'd forgive us. Pray that you keep us far from compromise. Help us to be diligent to kill sin. Give us wisdom for good missions to fight as you give us breath so that we would not uh, twiddle our thumbs, waste away our lives, learn lots about you and do nothing with it, but be uh, productive. That your kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven and that you use us to that end. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.